Hello, welcome to the first AFNI video presentation. I'm going to talk about uh, the, the introduction, the concepts, and the principles of AFNI. This will be followed by a presentation on uh, hands-on presentation for using the interactive AFNI uh, GUI. So the very first thing is this is a very important web page for anyone who wants to use AFNI. The web page with its uh, shortened version there will uh, have links to the AFNI installation instructions, the documentation, the data, uh, tips, etc. To use the hands-on videos, you'll need to install AFNI and then the prep for boot camp link that's also on the same page. AFNI, I created it back in 1994 to provide an environment for fMRI data analysis. AFNI slightly confusingly refers to both the program of that name, which was of course one of the first things written, and the entire package that's grown up around it over in the last 25 years. Important principles that we have followed in the development of AFNI is to allow you to stay close to your data and to view it in different ways because looking at data is very important. Every field there's always problems with data and fMRI is no exception. Uh, we give users the power to assemble the computational pieces in different ways to do different analyses because different research programs require different kinds of analysis. But with this power comes the responsibility to understand what you're doing when you put the pieces together. Otherwise, it's quite easy to put together an analysis that just doesn't make any sense. So we, provide, we can provide you with help, but you still need to understand. So that, that's encapsulated in this motto, which I took from a pro computer programming manual, provide mechanism, not policy. We can provide guidance, but we can't tell you what the right thing to do is. And, and, as, uh, and since AFNI is open source, it a lot, we allow other programmers to add features and components. Principles that we live by, we fix significant bugs as soon as possible. There's nothing secret or hidden in AFNI. Uh, possibly some things are not well documented or advertised. Things that are under development are not uh, usually explained very well because they're still in progress. Even if they're working, we still, we're still not quite sure or testing them. Release early and often. That's part of the fixing bugs. We find a bug, we fix it, we release a new version of AFNI, a new release. Uh, so that makes all beta users beta testers for life. And we help the user. We have a message board. Uh, we have a consult. We can consult in person with NIH users. Uh, and then, of course, we're continuing to do development. We try to anticipate the user's future needs. But of course, what we think you may need may not be what you really need. That's where consultations come in handy, and the message board. Before I really start into detail, I have to say that AFNI has a lot of programs, and each of them have a lot of options. The, the, this is a power, but assembling the programs to do something useful is confusing when you start. To uh, overcome this problem, we have developed superscripts that carry out important tasks. Each of these superscripts runs multiple AFNI programs in order to uh, f carry out complicated uh, sequence of tasks to produce, to produce something useful. We strongly recommend that you use these if you're going to use AFNI as the basis for your fMRI work because that will make it easier for you to get things right, will make it easier for us to help you, and so on. AFNI proc pi is the is most important of these. It's written in the Python language. So single, it's a single subject fMRI pre-processing and time series analysis for functional activation. It does both REST, which is very similar to task-based pre-processing, and then uh, and continues on with task data to functional activation maps for single subject. All of this is done in, in one uh, long sequence of operations. And then there's a, a subsidiary of AFNI proc pi, which is also very useful, Align API and NAT which does image registration. registration. It includes anatomical to API, anatomical to anatomical, API, API, and so forth. It was originally for an aligning echo planar images to an anatomicals, that's the name, but as the time has gone by, we've added more and more features to it. It's a very, because it turns out that when you're dealing with lots of MRI images, image registration is a common theme. 
What is functional MRI? In 1991, Ken Kwong and others at MGH Harvard discovered that the MRI signal met increases a few percent locally in the brain after increases in neuronal activity. Locally means map brain mapping. There is a cartoon of MRI signal in a brain, an activated brain voxel. Uh, a, the, before there's any brain activation, there's some sort of baseline level of, of, of the MRI signal. Not zero, but some, 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 some level that just represents the tissue just doing whatever it's doing. Then suppose there's five seconds of neural activity. In the first experiments uh, with Ken Kwong, it was a uh, flickering checkerboard. Later experiments with other people were used uh, finger tapping, uh, just repetitive finger tapping for, say, five seconds. Then what happens is there's still a couple of seconds of delay before the signal goes up. And then it takes about four or five seconds for the signal to rise to its maximum amplitude. And then after that, the S signal plateaus for about five seconds, if you have five seconds of neural activity. If you have 10 seconds of neural activity, you have 10 seconds of plateau, and so forth. And then, uh, w uh, delayed in time again, we have this four or five, six second fall, uh, the data back toward the baseline, and it either returns to the baseline or there may be an undershoot. That depends on the, on the p position in the brain. Well, this slowness of the response is a strong indication that this is not a direct measurement of neuronal activity, and no one ever actually thought it was. It's a measurement of changes in the blood, which, which explains why things are slow. And the, in particular, the signal increase is caused by changes in the water molecules that the MRI actually measures, uh, the magnetic field around the water molecules and that changes when more or less oxygenated hemoglobin is present. More oxygenated hemoglobin means more MRI signal. Now there are other ways to acquire MRI data that, that apply to functional MRI, but this is by far the most common one. This is called bold imaging, blood oxygenation level dependent signal. And it's a great acronym because it sounds so impressive. Yes? I have a question. What units do bold signal have when we measure them from the scanner? Technically speaking, the units of bold signal are magnetization density uh, in a voxel. However, no one cares about magnetization density because that's a, basically an arbitrary function of a whole bunch of different physical parameters which, which, which uh, nobody cares about in the first place. So really because it is essentially the bold imaging effect is a, a measurement of how much the blood oxygen changes from the uh, it, it sort of quiescent level, uh, and then as when there's more neural activity, you have more oxygen flooding into a particular region. It, it is best thought of as a percentage of the baseline. Uh, perhaps it should even better be thought of as a percentage of how max, much it could oxy, optimally go up to, but since we don't know how much that is, that it's better, it's easier to think of the uh, percentage. The actual amount of the rise is very small compared to the baseline. It rises about, if this baseline level is 1,000, it might rise up to 1,010, a 1% 1 1 value. That was a very good question, by the way. How do fMRI experiments done? Because we're only measuring changes from the baseline, the baseline signal itself is, has some relevance to neural activity, although not the actual magnitude of the baseline, the fluctuations do, but it's really the changes from the baseline that matter, so we have to alternate the subject state between two or more conditions. Uh, that's done with tasks to perform, sensory stimuli, the, now we're talking about the creativity of you, neuroscientists. And during this time, we acquire a lot of MR images over and over and over and over, very fast. This is the, the technology that makes MRI, fMRI possible is the technology to acquire images of the brain really fast in a second or two. And after that, we search for voxels, locations in the brain where the NMR signal time series, which you know, fluctuates up and down, matches the stimulus time pattern. So when I showed someone the flickering checkerboard of lights, the signal went up, the signal goes up, and when it wasn't on, it goes down. We know the time pattern of the stimulus, or we could measure it, perhaps, and then basically look for that pattern again in the brain. 
the thing that makes the fMRI difficult is that the signal changes due to the neural, this blood changes due to the neural activity are small, which means we need typically hundreds of images in each, in each location to uh, get reasonable amount of uh, statistical credibility, which means it takes 20 or 30 minutes to get reliable activation maps. And the other problem is that because the signal changes are small, as I said, 1% perhaps, uh, many other small effects can corrupt the results, which means we can't just do simple stuff. We have to post-process the data to try to reduce these other effects without eliminating what we like, the bold effect, and we need to be vigilant about the data in order to make sh sure that other the bad things haven't crept in that, that the pre-processing didn't allow for properly. Here's some sample data. In my experience in 20 plus years of dealing with fMRI data, I find that many people have never actually looked at single voxel time series data. So here is some. This was uh, relatively old data now, about 15 years old, so there's better data out now, but this is 64 by 64 matrix uh, of imaging, the, about three millimeter resolution. Uh, the time repetition, TR, between two successive images is two and a half seconds, and there were 130 points per imaging run. There were 10 imaging runs in this experiment, but I'm only showing you one. Here's a task that was on 27 seconds on and 27 seconds off, or rest. And this is really good data. This, this is primo voxel in a solid data set. I move the cursor over here. This red curve, this is the pattern 27 seconds on and off. And the pattern's been delayed in time, that couple of seconds we need from, from the hemodynamic response. And it's blur, it, goes, it doesn't go up and down super fast. It goes up and down because we know that the hemodynamic response takes four or five seconds, which is a couple of TRs to go up and down. So this is what we're looking for, the pattern. The black wiggly curve is the data in this vo single voxel, unsmoothed, you know, uncut data, and then the blue curve is the fit of this pattern to the data, and in subsequent lectures we'll describe how this fit is calculated. This, and you can see very clearly that the, when the red curve is up, the blue curve is up, but even by eye you can see when the red curve is up, the black curve is on average up. But you can also see that there's a lot of fluctuations in the black curve, that is the noise is about the same size as the signal change. That's why we need a lot of data, because if the signal change was much bigger, we'd just need a few images. But when we, the signal change is this, the noise in the data, when the signal change due to noise is the same size as the signal change due to our effect, we need a lot of data to, uh, look, to be reliable. Here's what one echoplanar image from this data set looks like on the left, and here's what one anatomical image look, looks like on the right little tiny things because that's what the screen space gives us. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the fundamental concepts of AFNI. The basic unit of data in AFNI is the data set. And that's a collection of one or more 3D rays of numbers. And every entry in, in this array is of course in a particular space, in a particular spatial location in a 3D grid. Image data sets are data from the scanner, image slices, slices from the scanner assembled into a 3D volume. A derived data set, which uh, become very common in fMRI data analysis, a derived data set where the numbers are computed from other data sets. So for example, a voxel value could be a T statistic that reports the significance of a fit from an fMRI time series model. So we have the up red curve up and down in the previous slide, and we have the, uh, I say, how, how good a fit was that? A big T statistic would mean it was a good fit. A small T statistic would mean it was a bad fit. In jargon, in AFNI, every 3D array in a data set in the AFNI documentation gets called a subbrick. There's one number in each voxel in each subbrick volume. So below at the bottom is a cartoon of a data set with four volumes which are numbered 0, 1, 2, and 3, because in AFNI, counting starts at 0. And here's a, car Oops. Stop that. Here's a cartoon of, uh, of a voxel, of a data set where the voxel grid is three voxels on the side, which isn't a very high resolution. Here's a blow up of that, one voxel in a 3 by 3 by 3 grid. 
Now, real grids, of course, are more like 64 by 64 by 30, or perhaps 128 by 128 by 50, stuff like that. Uh, depends on your scanner, what you're looking for, and so on. What's inside a data set? The data set's a bunch of data, and they tend to be a lot of data because we have a lot of images. Besides those numbers that make up the images, a data set also contains a lot of auxiliary information, such as the spatial size of each voxel in millimeters, the orientation of the data set in space, the location of the data set in space. If you just want to look at an image, you don't need to know where it is, but if I want to look at one data set in space and overlay another one on it, I need to know where they are relative to each other, otherwise I'll be overlaying the ventricles from one person on the hippocampus uh, f from the same person's other data or from a different person. So it's important to get these coordinates right. Fortunately, nowadays it's pretty easy to do automatically, sometimes. Uh, if we have data that runs through time, that, then we have the, the dimension, the spacing of the data not in millimeters in, for time, but in seconds. I, in AFNI, I call those 3D plus time data sets to distinguish those from data sets where there's just a bunch of data stuck to different volumes stuck together. And these 3D plus time data sets are the basic unit of fMRI data. And then if it's a statistical derived data set, uh, so there might be parameters associated with the subbrick. For example, a uh, t-statistic subbrick has to have the degrees of freedom for the t-statistic. A question? I had a question about the orientation of the data sets. So if I know that I'm at a location minus 5, minus 7, positive 10, can you tell me where I am in the data set with this orientation? I can show you where it is, but I can't tell you verbally. Well, can you tell if I'm on the right or the left? I'm just wondering how that maps onto the orientation. It depends on the coordinate system in use, because there, in imaging, there are basically two different coordinate systems that are widely used. One is where the x-axis runs from negative is on the right to positive on the left and the y-axis runs from the anterior front of the, of the head to the posterior back of the head, and the z-axis from the bottom, or inferior, to the superior of the head. That's the, that's the coordinate system that comes from the scanners. That's called DICOM, which is the standard format for storing medical images. In neuroscience, most people publish with the X and Y axes reversed. So left is negative and right is positive, which of course is the way it's usually drawn on a piece of paper. So when I, you ask when X is say minus seven millimeters, is that on the right or left? You have to know what the coordinate system is, which is sometimes not spelled out too well in papers. Uh, if it's not spelled out in papers, probably they're using the neuroscience, or sometimes called the neurological coordinate system, which is something that was just made up by neuroscientists versus radiologists who have actually a printed book with their coordinate system in it. So, in my opinion, the neuro radiologists win, but that's just my opinion. AFNI formatted data sets get stored in two files. Uh, one is called dot .head as a suffix of dot .head. That holds all the auxiliary or extra information I was talking about. That's in text format or ASCII characters. And the brick file holds all the numbers in all the subbricks. So if you had uh, a volume that was 1,000 by 1,000 by 1,000 numbers, well, that would be a billion numbers, which would be a pretty high resolution volume. Data sets can be stored in one of two or marked as being stored in one of two coordinate systems, which uh, in the interface are sometimes called views. Uh, one is called the original data, or in, in the file name has, it says plus or ridge, and that means it's from the scanner. TLRAC or plus TLR view, uh, RC view is data set has been res rescaled to correspond to some atlas. Originally, the Taylorac Trineau atlas published in the mid-1980s, or more commonly now, another atlas such as the MNI template, one of the MNI templates. And these are sometimes called stereotaxic coordinates. All data sets scaled and aligned to some atlas are labeled plus TLRC for historical reasons, and inside the header file, it will hold the name of the actual atlas space, such as MNI. The alignment between the original view, where you, the data that you get from the scanner, and the, and the uh, 
Taylor and the Taylorac view, the M, the M and I or whatever space, can be a, a linear alignment or nowadays more commonly a nonlinear alignment. AFNI dataset file names then have three parts: the user selected prefix, which can be almost anything, the view, which is either plus or ridge or plus TLRC, the suffix, which is one of head or brick. So, for example, Tony Fauci underscore EPI plus TLRC.head. The prefix is Tony Fauci underscore EPI, just to choose a random person. You supply the prefix, and the AFNI program supplies the rest. AFNI programs can read data sets stored in various other somewhat old formats, but that, uh, we won't talk much about that right now, if some of them may come up in other talks. Yes? Uh, how does AFNI deal with nifty files? That is an excellent question of the slide that I just started to show. Nifty files uh, are, which have a suffix of .nii, which is pronounced ni, or .ni.gz, which is the compressed version, uh, is, this is a standard format that there was a set of summit meetings back in the mid-2000s uh, about this that we all agreed upon. And the goal was so that we could in interop interoperability, which was a very long word, that we agreed to, so people could mix and match tools from different packages, FSL for part of the analysis, AFNI for part of the analysis, for example. All the data gets stored in one file, and there's a, actually a, a website that we have uh, with a little bit of activity on this. Uh, there's a 352-byte header, and then just all the numbers. And this is, allows for 1D to 5D dimensional data sets, and the numbers inside can be integers of various kinds or floating point numbers. AFNI will read and write these data sets. To write, when you give the prefix, when the program says, I want a prefix, you end the prefix in .nii or .nii.gz, and the AFNI program will just say, oh, he wants that format, here it is. To read it, you just give the full file name that ends in .nii or .nii.gz, and then it says, oh, well, she wants to read this file, and so there it is. Now, of course, where do you get data sets from in the first place? Well, ideally, someone else does it for you, but nevertheless, you should know how to do it if you're trapped on a desert island with a scanner and a computer. And that is, program number one for that is written by uh, Rick Reynolds, who is uh, just a few feet away from me as I record this, and that's a program called Daimon. This was originally created for sending image data directly into AFNI for real-time fMRI, which will be a subject of a later presentation. And, but it can also just create data sets at the same time. Program two is a program by Chris Rorden, who is not in my group, unfortunately, and that is called dcm to nii x underscore afni, which is not that easily pronounceable, but it is a very useful program. It can create an entire collection of data sets, not just one data set at a time, and will work with somewhat more formats than Daimon does. One problem with this is that it doesn't, the nifty format doesn't store complicated slice timings. It wasn't something that people did 15 years ago. So programs like DCM to Nix to AFNI can't store this kind of information, even if the program knows how to find it in the DICOM files, which is often not the case because it's hidden by the manufacturers. So one solution is to use 3D refit to take the slice timing and stick it into the AFNI header. Yes, is there a question or comment? A comment. Rick Reynolds has a comment. <laughs> so DCM to NIIX AFNI, or just DCM to NIIX, writes the uh, slice timing into a JSON file now, so a sidecar. So uh, they can deal with the more complicated timing because they don't put it in the Nifty header. Yes, that's a, that's a good point, R Rick. So the JSON file that DCM to, to Nix uh, produces then can be imported in, into uh, the Nifty file, where because in AFNI we have an extension to the Nifty files that stores all sorts of information that Nifty doesn't allow for. So that can be imported in, and then it's stored inside the Nifty file. But that's not directly done by Chris Rorden's program because he wants to write Nifty files that are usable by everybody, not just us. Uh, data set directories. Data sets get stored in directories, which in uh, some people call folders, and all the data sets in the same directory 
are kind of presumed to be aligned in XYZ coordinates. That is, values with voxels that have the same value of XYZ correspond to the same brain location. And with that assumption, you can overlay in color any one data set from the directory on top of any other one data set, which in the program appears in, un in grayscale, and that's called an underlay. Even if the voxel sizes and spatial orientations differ, because the, the data set says, I'm here, uh, my voxels are this size. And the overlay is based on XYZ coordinates, not on just voxel correspondence. And typical contents of a directory are the anatomical reference data image or images, uh, 3D plus time data sets from functional MRI, statistical data sets computed from those, and data sets transformed from original space to some template space for further analysis in a group. Where do you get AFNI from? Well, I already mentioned this uh, website for, down, for in instructions and downloading. AFNI runs on Unix. So that's Linux in the old days was Sun, uh, Mac OS X, and now you can run it under the Windows subsystem for Linux as well. Uh, our message board is a very important place to get help. And you can also get the source code for, uh, from our website or from GitHub. AFNI gets updated fairly frequently. Bug fixes, new features, uh, people request features, we implement them. And so it's important to update your binaries occasionally, otherwise it's very hard to help you with outdated versions. Uh, so you should check for updates every few months. And finally, we're very close to the end now, I promise, that we just want to mention the SUMA program in AFNI. SUMA is the AFNI surface mapper. And it is for displaying surface models of cortex. The surfacer, surfaces that people use usually come from FreeSurfer, but it will work with surfaces from other programs. Inter it interactively displays functional activations mapped from 3D volumes to the cortical surface. You can draw ROIs for the brain directly on the cortical surface. In, and in AFNI, you can draw ROIs into, into the 3D volume. There's a so there's a dis difference there. And you can map these ROIs between the surface and back into the volume. SUMA is separate from AFNI. It's a separate piece of software with a separate graphical interface, but it can talk to AFNI. Uh, and then if the two programs are communicating, you can click in either one to change the focus point for the crosshairs, and the other program jumps to the same location given by the XYZ coordinates at the same time. And you can take the functional color overlay in AFNI and splash it into SUMA for simultaneous display. So there's a lot more to SUMA. Stay tuned for the SUMA talks yet to come. And that's all for now, folks. Keep calm and carry on. Thank you.